Let me open it up now, please. Um, usual rules, identify yourself, indicate if you wish to address a question to a particular panelist, keep it short. We've got 12 minutes left. We need to get responses as well. I'm going to take the three I can see in front of me, notably because there are two women among them. Um, I'm Amanda Mate from South Africa. Um, I'm here as a digital matriarch. I have a couple of questions. Um, in terms of the political leadership of Africa that we're currently facing, at what point do we begin to bridge the conversation of youth in the political space and political discussion and policy making discussions? And this is across to all panelists. Then specifically, um, I wanted to look specifically, Scott, sorry, um, at how do public and private partnerships for Senegal and each of the countries represented work, and how have they benefited the mass populace? Super, just pass it on, I'm gonna take all three of them. Hello, thank you everyone. Um, my name is Enyola Mafe from Nigeria. My question was around the development story that my generation will essentially inherit. Um, so the jobless growth that, um, that was mentioned, um, the issue of mono cities for, uh, that many of the countries um, deal with in terms of mega cities, but how do we build out tertiary or secondary or tertiary cities? And what are those kind of strategies that our generation can engage with uh, various other generations to try to answer um, some of those um, issues that we will be inheriting in the next 20, 50 years? And keep it going. I'm Meir Shifrit from Israel, and I have a question about the leadership in Africa. How come that so many leaders, which they finally the term, they finish as a billionaires? It shows you that in Africa, a lot of things cannot be done without paying off. I have friends who work in Africa. Nobody of them can work without paying off to leaders, politicians, and others. Show me a good leader. We have a slogan which says that the Fish stink from the head. All you need in Africa, in every country, is a good and honest leader. If we be one person over there, which we really use the possibility and the potential of Africa, Africa will change upside down. I don't believe that contribution from the world will save you. I believe that you should make it yourself. It's much more better to use the emotion and the possibility and the growth that you have in Africa in order to develop your countries in order to make a progress compared to the rest of the world. Come here. Thank you. Are we going to take two over here in the front row? We're, we're, we're correcting the entire gender imbalance. Ceci, bien sûr, va essayer de pallier à manque d'égalité genre, parce qu'il y a eu un monopole de parole émanant de femmes. Question de souche from the University of Benin. I would like to thank all the panelists. So if there is ever a general conclusion to be kept in mind, at least in the light of what Mr. Sinsu and Gadjo have said and have put forward, the necessity of changing paradigms, uh, changing models, inventing models uh, regarding at least uh, employment growth uh, and, uh, of course, security and politics. Uh, but uh, at the end of the story, do you happen to have the opportunity or the impression, at least, that uh, political leaders, be they national or from the EU, do take into consideration those suggestions and proposals? And then when we speak about the EU and Africa and the relations between both, I think that right now in Abidjan, uh, so we have uh, one more edition about uh, uh, at least by the end of November, the EU-Africa partnership. Uh, uh, so Europe has already had the opportunity to listen to political leaders, doing their analysis, assessments, putting in place different forms of cooperation. Are there any improvements to introduce in terms of those mechanisms of dialogue and cooperation? Marie Roger Biloa. Thank you for this uh, quite impassioned panel. The question that I would like to ask uh, has been actually alluded to here and there in as much as uh, when we look at uh, the usual figures regarding Africa's potential, which for me is quite impressive. 
Uh, while speaking about innovation, no paradigms, as Christine put it, I do wonder whether or not there is a peculiar chapter to be further added up to the political processes, and by this I mean the following. At a given time, I was quite critical as to the external will of imposing political systems to support what we call democracy. Now we're at a phase where Africans are more demanding than ever before of this democracy. They are even uh, getting or uh, committed to have this democracy that they're struggling for, particularly where we are going to have uh, citizens that uh, are looking for alternatives uh, that would like to have a word to say. I'm having in mind Gabon, where the political class did take part to a whole elections process, but at the end, uh, there was uh, really nothing concrete. So we want Africa to change. But we keep speaking about economies, uh, about figures. We are overlooking what could bring about change, namely uh, uh, renewal of political elites and renewal of the decision-making processes and decision-making spheres. So is it a taboo? Uh, so is there any, are there any more efforts uh, to be injected in order for this change? To we have less than six minutes. We have four people. Pick a question, the one you feel most strongly about, and respond to that as briefly and as effectively as you can. I'm going to eat it. I have my mic. That, yeah, it does work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to pick up the corruption piece. Uh, the gentleman, I don't know, I don't hear well where you're from. Israel. Israel. I think you had also some pretty serious cases there, right? <laughs> so this is also uh, what I'm talking about changing the narrative. The African are corrupt. Um, it doesn't work like that. I think human beings are corrupt if you don't put up a legal framework to fight corruption. Um, the worst cases actually don't come out of Africa. The biggest corruption cases, I think it was in the US, <laughs> in terms of volumes, etc. What we have to do, and I think I can cite um, Senegal, because I was Minister of Justice, is to set up legal framework to combat corruption. Um, we have uh, put the law that require every single leader to declare assets, uh, when you're in and when you get out. We have voted a, transparent, a transparency code for uh, public fundings, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that has to be implemented. So we are making progress. But the idea that corruption is you know, born and survive in Africa is just a wrong one and part of the narrative we need to change. And that's, that's important to say that. Good. Thank you. Un cliché trop fort euh, qu'il faudrait penser à changer. C'est bon. C'est bon. Je crois que c'est bon. Oui, oui, c'est ça. D'abord, moi, je veux me réconcilier avec mes... I would ah, like to further reconcile with my brother and sister and, uh, and say that the, the people that have uh, the same thesis as uh, theirs, I consider them as being Afro-pessimists, why they consider themselves as being Afro-optimists. The reason is that it's like it's kind of destiny for the rhythm of growth of the continent to be where it is today and where there is we always tend to highlight uh, so the assets what's good uh, but i do believe that africa should be much more advanced than it is today and the main reason uh, and uh, uh, my friend says it's because i am dealing with peace and security but i also take care of pan-africanism african integration 
population development and I don't think that our African leaders do believe in disintegration. I define myself as someone that uh, uh, someone who is in between Afro-optimists and Afro-pessimists and in between I am standing as a relentless inexorable believer in uh, African uh, in, in Africans in Africa it's potential it's human resources it's natural resources and all its assets when we did abandon Marxism so we held a meeting and we decided that we were going to become critical realists uh, and uh, that uh, critical realism consists in looking at what's happening highlighting what's good uh, what's positive but lay emphasis mainly on uh, the um, weaknesses uh, so if we look at the DRC should DRC be at the level of development that uh, uh, it has reached today so many models haven't uh, been uh, um, leading to something concrete and positive because uh, Sheikh Anta Job said that we need political unity so and because we tend to move with different gears and things uh, are taking place in such a way as to maintain status quo so many problems uh, encountered by our uh, African co-citizens in order for them to cross the borders so we need to revisit the development paradigm Africa should compete with India and uh, China with leaders that believe in the African continent rather than to, uh, um, struggling or no, in order to remain forever in the decision making and uh, authority position that they are occupying. 2063, one more point, Two, one line. Why? I think that these people are pessimists because they think uh, that they can work for uh, 2063 agenda where an established uh, economist uh, specialized in Africa. It's been 50 years that we've uh, been promised that African problems will be issued, uh, promising us paradise instead of a realistic model of development uh, because we need to have uh, Africans or not a single one of them being left out. Let us stop having this utopian promise and be more realistic. Regarding the questions uh, asked and raised, I do believe that as many of my colleagues here have pointed out to there are two main issues that I need to highlight. I'm going to be very brief. First of which has to do with the fact that we can't uh, have uh, a fully developed uh, Africa without investing in human resources, in human capital, which is uh, 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 instrumental in everything. Take the example of aeronautics. Aeronautics show, saw the light in Morocco because we had the uh, human potential, the human capital, and then came the favorable business climate with the involvement of different stakeholders. As long as you have qualified labor, all other potentialities and uh, assets will follow. Secondly, we need to move uh, from uh, the logic of uh, superficiality to that of focus. So now we want to do many things at a time, but if we prioritize things and we focus on two or three major issues, we can experience the needed development. Uh, let's take the case of the coffee, of the coffee. Well, the coffee, uh, so, and we have, so we have have the human potential and the human capital, and we can do all this. So regarding the anger of Sheikh Tidjian, I think that you need to make room for the historical teachings. So in 2017, we're not accountable for all what happened to us. So when you build a, a, an economy in Senegal uh, built on peanuts uh, or on uh, palm oil, uh, so there are physical limits in our infrastructures. Uh, 
We're in a history, and we are uh, revisiting history and reshuffling states and governments, the legacy of which is uh, quite rudimentary and quite basic. So we can become outrageous. It's not that our leaders are reluctant to have in uh, integration. We're moving uh, much more rapidly than Mercosur and maybe with the same pace as that of EU. Morocco, uh, together with South Africa, Nigeria, so the first investors in Africa, so look uh, in the field of services, it's even moving more rapidly with uh, commodities exchanges. So, and I would like to address the question of our generation, as pointed out to by the Nigerian sister and changing models. So it's relatively clear today that we need to pay attention to secondary and tertiary cities because we need to get out of the added value of 74% in Lagos uh, and in Abidjan, etc. We need to find out uh, territorial equilibrium and also take into consideration the rural uh, differences and informal sector uh, Rwanda and Morocco is one uh, are two of the very few countries that are seeking to include informal sector sector in modernity in order not to say in uh, the fiscal harassment, but let's say in modernity. And your generation has wonderful chances with, uh, uh, of course, technologies uh, that are not at all expensive, that are quite adapted to our models, namely uh, Digital economy. Digital economy, when it is observed in Morocco, in Nigeria, be it uh, archiving the uh, so on, uh, done by the small retailers in the weekly marketplaces in the iCloud of the supply chain. So we have technologies and in the agricultural field that are tailored to our problems and that are going to allow for social changes and also in terms of the cost. Uh, uh, to educate uh, human capital translates into 25 million young people every single year. We have technical responses where we're moving very quickly, such as mobile payment, uh, e-commerce, so financially speaking, such a great financial inclusion taking place at such a, a speedy pace, uh, an unprecedented speedy pace uh, everywhere else in the world, so it's an emerging economic model, which is quite different from our technology. So you've already achieved this technological leap that has made of Africa the first ever in terms of its use of new technology. So that's a, a very strong, powerful model evolution where Europe could help us accelerate the pace in the implementation of this Europe. Uh, so what we're asking Europe to do is not to assist us, but to help us move more rapidly. And that's something fundamentally different. And I took the example of payment, that of public health, that of agriculture, renewable energies, uh, uh, local uh, micro networks. Uh, and I will uh, end with a few words on politics. Here and again, please take into consideration the historical part of the narrative, Senegal, Gambia, Ghana, Senegal, Ghana, and uh, she forgot Benin, I don't know why. Benin also, Mali and Kenya. Look at the magnitude of those uh, mutations and transformations, all those emerging public opinions. Uh, so since the Arab Spring took place with the Jasmine Revolution and jihadist movements here and there, what happened in Ouagadougou, what's taking place in the streets of Kinshasa, there is a public opinion, there are social media, even when 
results are erroneous and fake. Uh, so many honorable uh, democracies so have issued fake results, uh, but uh, it's a pity to have uh, fake uh, erroneous results uh, in a country like Benin. But this happened in France. Uh, so between two opposing parties when they were doing their internal uh, elections, uh, the fact that we're still making uh, um, outcomes being erroneous, particularly when it comes to local democracies, because the closer you are to the uh, voters, uh, so there are even there is even more democracy in the municipality, in the local government than at the national level. But what is striking is the pace of this population control and the level of command they have of uh, the voter turnout and the election of the decision makers. So I'm not the strongest advocate of uh, the current regime in Benin. In other words, I would have I love to take care of it by myself. But we have the freedom of uh, we have the freedom of the media with no political prejudices. I think you've had a remarkable opportunity to get an understanding of what is changing in Africa. You can look back and you can express concern about everything that has characterized the past. You could look back on the period since 2000 and look at the remarkable wave of transformation that has occurred across the continent, the rise of democratization, the increase in economic activity, the beginnings of the return of the diaspora, and the enormous wealth creation that has taken place in respect of returns on foreign direct investment. Lionel's concluding remarks, however, go to the center of this particular issue. A new generation is rising. You heard some of them speak a few minutes ago. That generation is not going to tolerate corruption. That generation is not going to tolerate autocratic rule. That generation is better educated, more sophisticated, and much more engaged with global standards. Africa is rising for two very fundamental reasons. The population is growing and is young. Urbanization is occurring at an extraordinary rate. And as many of our panelists have said today, an increasing amount of economic activity is actually endogenous. Returns on foreign direct investment in Africa for 30 years have been higher than any other market in the world. And Lionel again made the points highly effectively in the closing sessions. It's happening. The only question is whether one's going to participate or not. If one is going to, there are going to be extraordinary opportunities. If not, there are going to be enormous problems for Europe, because believe me, China and India increasingly are seizing these opportunities on the African continent on a significant scale. Thank you to all of the panelists. They did an extraordinary, uh, sorry for having to be so disciplined in respect of it, but you can see the reason.